your one hour session. Okay, so let's get started. Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining our session for today and we're going to focus on a social media campaign for MSMEs and freelancers. Uh, creating a social media campaign is not as easy as a lot of people thought it would be. Uh, it requires a lot of preparation, so let's go about it. So initially, when people talk about social media campaign, the typical idea is, you know, just post something on Facebook on a daily basis, and technically, you're doing a social media campaign already. That's that's how most of us uh, would perceive it. And I don't blame you. In fact, uh, there was a time that, you know, I was just contented of posting stuff online. You know? And um, especially if it works for you, you know, why not? Uh, however, of course, if you're going to render this as a service to clients, whether MSMEs or outsourcing entities, you need to think more, you need to plan as to what your social media campaign is going to be all about. And this needs to encompass not just looking at it from a social media campaign perspective, but also from a digital marketing campaign perspective, and also from an inbound sales perspective. Because at the end of the day, you need to be able to convert sales somewhere along the way and uh, and it all starts with your goals i mean why are you doing social media campaigns or digital marketing campaigns uh, to begin with um should you even run a campaign i mean can't you just have a social media page and just post something every day and just be happy about it especially if it's generating you uh, results that you need uh, however if you really want to grow and improve yourself as a social media marketer or as an e-commerce specialist or as a digital marketing uh, specialist you need to constantly measure yourself you need to run things like in a series of sprints no? like something like on a two weeks or a one month or a two month campaign and what you want to be able to do is to assess your performance on a regular basis because that's the only way that you can improve uh, earlier, I mentioned that uh, this whole e-commerce and digital marketing campaign series is part of my 66-day uh, campaign. So I'm like in my case, even though I'm running this whole series for free, but actually this is a campaign on my part, and I have I have set some goals, and I want to assess whether whether I am achieving my goals or not, and what are the ripple effects of what I'm doing. So. So those are just parts of it. So, so it is important to have those uh, goals. Now, different people have different goals. Different campaigns have different goals. But one way or the other, it would be supporting any of these. Sometimes we have campaigns that are only intentional on achieving one aspect. Although in some, in some cases, you want to be able to achieve all of them. For me, when I do a campaign, Regardless whether it's focused on brand awareness, whether it's focused on sales conversion, I believe that the moment you carry it out on social media, whether you like it or not, indirectly, you're gonna do the entire thing. I mean, one way or the other, you're gonna affect the entire thing. So, for example, if I'm doing this webinar series for free, one might say that I'm doing a brand awareness campaign. But on the other hand, people might also say that I am doing a relevance or credibility campaign. Uh, but, of course, in the process of doing it, I'm also generating increase in the process from people who would like to learn more, people getting advice, uh, people inviting us or inviting me as a resource person uh, for their program or, or people trying to see if they can get me as a consultant for a project. So technically, I'm also generating leads in the process. And if I, if I get booked for speaking engagements or if I get booked for a project, then that, in, that on its own is also, is also a sales conversion, right? And if I have people who in the process of doing this series became, um, how do you call it, became loyal or you recommit them to your brand, I mean, people that you might have known before or you might have done business before, but, you know, uh, because, so of course, they meet new people, new players, they encounter new ideas. Uh, maybe, you know, they've moved on, but because you're doing something again, uh, they decided that, well, yeah, why not? Why don't I just sign up and, you know, see what I can get? And if they like what, they, what they're getting, then 
that's also an example of uh, re rebuilding your rebuilding loyalty to your brand. So campaign goals for can be different to a lot of people, uh, or can be different to a lot of brands. But I would like, but I believe that regardless what your campaign goals are, whether you're focused on awareness, leads relevance or credibility, sales conversion or loyalty, one way or the other, you will end up doing all of them, with which, whichever path you choose. Because in social media, even though you're selling, you just can't keep on selling. Otherwise, people will shoot out. So you have no choice but to also be flexible in offering other types of content just to keep that audience engaged. So in the process, you're also doing all the other components, even though you're focused on one aspect alone. So I hope that uh, you keep that in mind um, when designing your campaigns. I remember in our classes, uh, when doing social media campaigns, I would typically require my students to create three posts. And usually there must be something on awareness, consideration, decision, because I tell them that they cannot keep on uh, selling all the time. And usually I would end up having an argument with a student or two who would insist, look, I'm just focused on selling. So why that don't, why don't I just post my sales content every day, encouraging people to buy, especially if I have nice pictures because picture sells. No, that's what I would usually get. And I would tell them that, you know, if you just keep on selling every day, no matter, like, if you're selling cashews, no matter how I love kasoy or cashews, but if all I see every day from you and in you appearing on my feed where you will just keep on selling your cashews, showing me various sizes, various flavors, or what ha or whatever preparation, sooner or later, I'm going to get sick of it. And most likely, I'm going to unfollow you. So, and, and... And of course, you might not consider that valid because that is just one person's opinion. But if I am a buyer and if I love cashews and if I'm going to feel that way, you have to be worried about it, right? So so it is important to be sensitive to your buyer. So I hope that when you are posting something, um, even though your intention maybe is to focus on sales, but don't don't forget that you are also doing all the other uh, activities. Now, another thing that I always want to emphasize to my students whenever or whenever I conduct talks on digital marketing, uh, digital marketing, of course, a, a big chunk of it, especially on social media, is all about numbers. Because at the end of the day, we want to measure this. We want to look at metrics. And usually metrics are measured in terms of engagement, reach, um, how many people click on your post, how many people convert, um, how many people commented, how many people share it. There are a lot of parameters. And and if you are focused on e-commerce, I, I always tell people that don't focus on the superficial parameters, but focus more on your bottom line uh, parameters. Like, for example, in my case, maybe because my content most of the time is serious the level of engagement that i have on my content is minimal but it doesn't mean that i'm not effective because most of the time the people who subscribe to our patreon the people who enroll in our programs the people who contact us or book us for engagements are not the ones who like our content, are not the ones who comment on our posts, are not the ones who share our content. So if that is your experience, then you have to think beyond the superficial metrics and perhaps you need to focus more on your bottom line metrics. So what I would suggest is when you do social media campaign or digital marketing campaign, um, think about the target audience and think about the 20% who will give 80% of your desired revenue. Um, you can have a lot of offerings, I'm sure, but at the end of the day, uh, what you want to be able to achieve is that digital marketing, if done right, especially if your content is highly targeted, um, will attract you to the 20% who will give 80% of your desired revenue. So for example, like I'm doing this free series um, people might say, I'm not getting anything out from it. But actually, through this series, 
is where I am able to attract the 20% who gives 80% of our revenue, those who contact us to design programs and to be deployed in, um, in some institutions or, or in some organizations, but are content but the content came directly from us. These are, for me, I consider them to be premium clients and they are the 20% who gives 80% of our desired revenue. So think about it, like when you do your campaigns, are you reaching out to the 20% who gives 80% of your revenue or do you end up looking at superficial numbers you look at the 80% of people who sign up to you, but technically are only giving a 20% of your revenue. Okay, so I hope that's a food for thought. And of course, there are many things that worries us about our uh, freelance, uh, about your e-commerce business or freelance business. Uh, there's, there's destruction, there's competition, and there's commoditization. Um, when you're marketing something, you're not the only game in town. There are other players who are out there who can be, who are better than you, or there are many shiny objects um, flashing on social media and including the hot topics that would get the attention of people. So people are basically uh, distracted. And, and of course, there's competition. There's someone out there who is always better than you, younger than you, have more ideas, have fresher ideas, have edgy executions that's your competition and and there's that aspect where your offerings are compared to others and people will just decide on price if all things are the same maybe some people will decide on price while others may say that if all things are the same i'm gonna go for the one who i like more or who's more likable to me who i feel more comfortable and of course, arriving at that level of comfort, who's more likable, who's more interesting, uh, who, who, you, who would you rather trust more, um, is, is a matter of how you build your relationships online. And that's the reason why when we market, we cannot just, when, when we do social media campaigns, it's not just about posting uh, one offer at a time. You need to think about many things, including can you attract customers with this? Uh, if you post this, will it imply that you are, I mean, at least the best choice at that moment? Um, will it encourage that person to act on it right away and purchase what you have to offer immediately? If they are skeptical about you or unsure whether they want to deal with you in the first place, would, would this offer convince people to try you out? And if they are your past customers who have not done business with you for a long time, will this help them? Um, will, will this offer recommit them to you, to your brand, and perhaps arrive at a certain uh, loyalty in the, in the process? So what you want to be able to do is when, decide, when delivering a campaign, you must, regardless of whatever type of campaign that is, you must focus on... Um, implementing a high achiever campaign. A high achiever campaign doesn't compete on price. Whether you're giving it away for free or whether you're putting a premium on it, at the end of the day, it's not about the price. It's about the value that you are giving. You're focusing on the specific benefit that you're making your customers feel that at the end of the day, when they look at the landscape or when they ask around, when they do their research, they realize that you're delivering something that others cannot just deliver. And in the process, it makes you worth more and, it, and people will pay more. But of course, you being worth more and being paid more will depend if you are able to target, like what I mentioned earlier, the 20%, who will give you your 80%, as often referred to as the Pareto rule. So we are. At, that is why if you remember in our session on branding, I challenge you to be to look at the way you communicate. Are you fascinating people when you communicate? And fascinating, it's not about, it's not, it is not about being funky, being funny, being skeptical, being loud, or, you know, utter all those four-letter words and, you know, try to be, 
show how liberated you are or how you don't care about the world what they think but you're just gonna express what you think it's not about that it's about when you communicate do people focus on what you're saying and put value to what you are saying uh, of course depending on the value that you give whether you're an entertainment value or or something of a different value so it depends on how people perceive you and when you carry out your social media marketing campaign in the long run every campaign that you execute whether on a daily basis on a weekly basis bi-monthly monthly quarterly annually through the years it must allow you to build a fascinating brand so meaning if digital filipino started in 1999 I must make sure that whatever I do through the years, especially as we reach our 20th year on 2018 or 2019, um, it's all part of achieving our goal of creating a fascinating brand. And a fascinating brand should provoke strong and immediate emotional reaction. People are compelled to take action. You create advocates that people will talk about your brand, speak about you, share it to other people because they believe that you are credible and trustworthy or relevant for that matter. You become a cultural shorthand for a specific set of actions or values. So if we become a cultural shorthand for e-commerce, for people who would like to learn more about e-commerce, for people who would like to avail, about, avail of free e-learning on the topic, for people who would like to learn about digital marketing and now we're trying to also create our content on digital leadership so so it depends it depends on you on how does this play play out with your branding do do you incite conversation do you make people talk about your content and do you force your competitors to realign to what you are doing and are you even tapping into or even part of a social revolution? So, so let's say e-commerce is now going through what we refer to as a social revolution. So can we say that we are benefiting from that social revolution? Can we say that we are part of that social revolution? So whatever you do online and whatever campaigns you run, don't just focus on your short-term goals, short-term benefits, short-term earnings. Focus on how is this going to affect uh, what you envision your brand to be in 10 or 20 years time. That is, if you're if you see what you're doing right now to be something that you're going to be doing for the next 10 years or for the next 20 years of your life. No. So remember, uh, when we post something on social media, it doesn't matter what type of messages you say about yourself. I mean, you can claim anything under the sun, you know? but at the end of the day, it's um, do people remember what you said? Do people even care about it? And do people even act, about, act on it, whether they incorporate it in what they do, they use it as one of the guides in what they do, or do they share it? and uh because they see it as relevant to other people all right so we have a question here from gabriel hi gab great to see you here uh do you register your brand to dti right away after organization or what's the tipping point before you do it um of course uh ideally uh if depends no if you see your business as something that you would like to do for the long term then ideally you would want to register now but if you consider your business as a hobby then you might not need to register if it's only a hobby but the moment your income increases then you need to register um another way of of course there are many ways that you can go about it you can register or you can partner with a company who can handle all the administrative uh, transactions um, or you can remain employed and you do freelance activities and you declare your freelance activities as other income when you file your regular ITR as an employee. So there are many ways that you can go about it. But if you see yourself uh, putting up a business that is that and you have a vision for it, it's going to grow, you're going to expand branches, you're going to get a lot of clients, then, then maybe it's going to be worth it na talagang uh, mag-register ka, whether in the Philippines or in other parts of the world where you want to open your business. Okay. 
way. So you just decide uh, which strategy would work best for you. No? And remember, uh, insofar as branding is concerned, um, we, always, we always say that we tend to get carried away with the trend. Just because somebody's post is popular, a lot of people are liking it, a lot of people are commenting on it, a lot of people are sharing, sharing it. It doesn't mean that we should copy what they're doing and adopt it to ourselves, no? Adopt it to ourselves and, you know, apply the same formula. Usually, it doesn't work all the time because what makes that person fascinating, the factors that make that person fascinating, will not necessarily apply to you. So, to become more successful, you're encouraged not, not exactly to change, but become more of who you are. Parang ano lang yun eh. Parang kanta lang yun eh. Ano yun yung all of me loves all of you, di ba? All your perfect imperfections, di ba? Um, we're, of course, we're human beings. We're not perfect. And we're, we're seeing that in, in other people. They're not perfect as well. But what makes people drawn to them is because they're real. No? So uh, you put your best foot forward. Um, uh, become real and of course show that you're human that you're a work in progress and that you're also constantly trying to improve yourself learn more and your desire to add value to others and pe and and if people see how genuine you are people will remember you and people will appreciate and respect your brand all right um if you can review the branding lesson uh for this topic uh, i think this was lesson two where we discussed this heavily you can visit howtofascinate.com and take the test so that you can discover what makes you fascinating to others. You can also go to brandfascination.com and take the test in, in application to a specific product or service that you have uh, so that you can see what makes your brand fascinating and how you can improve your messaging and uh, what marketing pillars should you observe when you market. And you can review lesson two for that. If you want to learn more on that topic where I discuss that in detail and you can check that out in our in the YouTube link that I shared to you earlier. Okay, so we sorted out our branding. Now normally when you want to do your campaign, you always want to look back at your brand. Um, are you still aligned with your brand? No. Uh, but there's another thing. How do you know that your product or service offering will click in the market? And I think that's one of the reasons why we want to do campaigns regularly because it gives that necessary humility. No? Na sometimes we think that our ideas are the best, but the moment we start marketing it, pushing it to the market, we realize, oh my God, I, I didn't do, I, I, I missed it. Or kaya, uh, you know, I didn't deliver it as I, as I hope I will be able to deliver it and satisfy my client. So there's a lot of uh, ongoing trials, testing, lessons learned. But I think what is important is that you give yourself room for failure because each failure in your campaign will give you an opportunity to calibrate and do better in your next campaign. If, if you are a freelancer and you're working for a client that doesn't give you that room, then, then maybe that client isn't realistic either, no? Uh, of course, clients would prefer to be on target and 100% accurate, especially if, if they're paying you a lot of money. But if they're pushing you also to be experimental, to be edgy, to, do, to discover markets, then at least you need some leg room uh, to be able to do your test. But of course, there are a lot of tools that you can use to um, be tactical in your approach. So it all starts with our understanding of our customer needs and, and knowing what value proposition we have to offer. So remember in lesson three of our series, I indicated that before you start any campaign, whether you are an MSME or a freelancer rendering a service, make sure that you understand the value proposition of your, of your product. And at the same time, how will this suffice or fulfill the need of your target market? Because that can be your guide in creating uh, digital marketing or social media marketing campaign messages. So it must be clear to you as how your product benefits your customer, but put it from the perspective of your 
customer rather than from the perspective of your brand. What's in it for the buyer? How will this help fulfill what jobs this person needs to achieve? Uh, how will your product make their lives better based on the aspirations that this person may have for himself or herself? And how does your product help your target market take their problems away uh, based on the pains that they typically encounter with their job? For example, in this series where we're talking about e-commerce and digital marketing, what's in it for the MSME? Um, it can be valuable to an MSME who would like who, the MSME who believes that they need to utilize online resources, whether social media, having a website, what have you, uh, as a means to reach out to new markets and get customers. So if that MSME believes that that is something that they need to do, then I can say that what's in it for the buyer, then this is something that can be one of your inputs if you would like to learn more. Now on the question on how will it make their lives better, if the MSME's desired gain is that they'll be able to gain the knowledge and apply it to their business. And if I am able to provide something that, that can achieve that purpose, like we're doing the series, you study it and you can apply it to your business, then I can say I am satisfying that gain. If the MSME's problem is time because they cannot attend lessons, they cannot enroll in programs to learn, um, and, uh, and maybe uh, including they have limited budget in order to get started, then I could say that, yeah, I'm taking that pain away because I'm giving you stuff, something that you can access whenever you're available. And at the same time, I'm not asking you for anything in return. You just make, your, make time for you to study the content. So, so this is an example of trying to arrive at a value proposition, but instead of looking at it from your perspective, when, when disseminating that information, disseminate it from the perspective of what your target market desires to achieve. So on lesson three of our series, we talked about the value proposition canvas. So you can check out lesson three if you want to learn more on coming up with a value proposition that is designed to fulfill the needs of your target market. Okay. And... Of course, coming up with value proposition is important, but it is also our responsibility when running a campaign that we need to understand more our buyer persona. Um, and, and if we have a better understanding, then we, this allows us to have some focus and clear targeting of the market segments that we have. That's why if you notice, uh, when we're promoting the series, I was very specific. I was focusing on MSMEs and I was focused on freelancers. I'm not targeting large enterprises. I'm not targeting, uh, you know, some some uh, high end person out there. I I was I was deliberate in saying that I'm trying to communicate, design my content to MSMEs or freelancers or bring this type of content for the appreciation of MSMEs and freelancers. All right. So, but if you are targeting, as I said earlier, the 20% who can give your 80%, for me, it may not be exactly the MSMEs and freelancers. It can be other players who are catering to MSMEs and freelancers who I can collaborate with and bring my content further to that segment. You know? So that is why sometimes our customers are not necessarily our market segments that we are aiming for, but it can also be uh, prospective partners where if we work together with them, we will also be able to achieve reaching out to our target market. So this can, these are people who can act on your idea. Usually your Pareto, your 20% will give you your 80%. Um, you will be able to reach out to it if you focus on players who, who you can collaborate with and have a win-win relationship. These are doers, suppliers, influencers, and innovators. Doers who can, who can organize people, who can help you reach out to a bigger market without you having to do it on your own. 
uh, suppliers, those who can give you technologies that you need to carry out what you need to do. Like, for example, of course, we're carrying this out via webinar. Um, I know that there are many ways to deliver uh, ideas like this, but but for me, I rather use a technology that I can rely on, and and even if I have to pay a premium for it, because having supplier partners is not about getting something for free, but getting something that you can rely upon. No, um, influencers can be people who can adopt your power and promote your the ideas that you have, and innovators. No, the, those who can. Uh, see areas of collaboration where opportunities can open up for you. So there, there are there are many uh, actors who can act on your ideas. No, so it's just a matter of deciding who they are and how can you reach out to them. And hopefully through them, a ripple effect can be created. And the moment you are able to identify who these people are that you really want to reach out to and build relationships with, then you can further define them as your focus audience. Understand the politics that evolve under your focus audience, what you need to play with. Um, do Like, for example, if I'm working with government, do I need to submit to some form of bureaucracy? Do I need to understand the power structure and how can I survive in this power structure environment so that I don't get frustrated with it and and you know um, and adapt to that process? No, um, the companies that I want to deal with, what's their firmographics? No, uh, number of locations, number uh, where are where are they? Where where's the headquarters uh, located? What's the possible revenue size of this organization? The people that I'm gonna deal with as partners. If I'm gonna reach out to my target market segment, how, what is the age of the target market segment that they have access to that I can benefit from in achieving my goals? Uh, what are their social needs? What are their cultural needs? And even if I have a technical program, how do I make sure that I will be able to adapt this to meet social needs and cultural needs of the organizations that I would like to work with? And psychographics, what kind of personality these people have that I need to adapt to or that, 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 or that I need to be more understanding, uh, what values are important to them. Like if they value excellence, then I need to submit myself to that, to that kind of expectation and increase my level of commitment so I will not disappoint. Uh, what attitudes do they have? If they're conservative, then I have to be careful in presenting ideas that may that may go outside that but but i know that i need to push it but i need to make it sound conservative if you get what i mean um what interests do they serve what communities do they serve and what kind of lifestyle do they practice if I am able to understand my focus audience and if I am able to adapt to my focus audience, then there's that higher probability that I will, I will succeed in reaching out to that target market, especially if they are the 20% that's going to give me my 80%. Um, and our understanding of our customer needs, uh, especially from, from a bigger picture, if we will be able to narrow it down to a particular person uh, or to a particular position, then, then it will also help you uh, decide how are you going to carry out your one-on-one -on -one engagement. Social media campaigns and digital marketing campaigns, it's not just about factoring all the things that you're going to post online. It's also about factoring the offline conversations that can take place as a result of whatever you're doing online. It's all, it's all about talking to decision makers. It's all about talking to people who are inquiring about your services. So you cannot just say, yeah, you just look at our website. Oh, yeah, you just look at what we posted in our social media. That's it. That's what we're offering. So take it or leave it. I mean, you cannot, you cannot talk that way. Um, you need to be able to adjust your communication based on the market that you really want to reach out to. And being sensitive about it can make you more effective meaning translating everything that you're doing online and translate it to business revenue, ROI, 
or whatever you want to achieve for your business. So knowing the background of your prospect, what challenges they're facing, um, where are they located, what's their profile like, what's their job position, I mean, what are their concerns that made them reach out to you, what can you do to help this person, um, how can you identify them, what do they typically say, um, what are their goals, and uh, when you present an idea, what kind of assistance do they give to you, um, and all of this, you can, this can serve as an input so that you can improve your marketing messaging if you're going for partnership or collaboration. Why should they partner or collaborate with you and have a strong elevator pitch that, you know, that will be able to allow you to really set yourself apart from other alternatives that may, they may end up talking to elsewhere. And, and for them to realize that they need to get back to you because you are different and you have something better to offer than the rest. No? So, of course, when planning your digital marketing campaign, we talk about, your, we talk about revisiting your brand, revisiting your value proposition, revisiting your uh, target market. Because if you're going to do advertising, you're going to think about your target market anyway. And of course, you need to drive them to a particular website. What site can prospects visit to learn more about your offer? So, for example, uh, in our case, we can refer them to our YouTube channel. So you can have some form of a content showcase. You can a content showcase is very important. It serves as a portfolio. So depending on what kind of products or services that you are offering, you need to have a portfolio on. Um, nowadays, when there are a lot of players, people will always look for evidence. And sometimes the evidence are not so obvious. Like, for example, if I, can, if I will just keep on blogging my heart out, and if I will just keep on blogging articles, yeah, they would like about they, they They might like it. But sooner or later, you have to organize them somewhere along the way. So that is why instead of just uploading YouTube videos, I have to put some overarching theme. Last year, we did our e-commerce and digital marketing mentoring program for MSMEs. This year, we're doing our e-commerce and digital marketing mentoring program for MSMEs and freelancers so that there's a clear uh, branding idea that you're trying to communicate to your prospects and other showcase content that they might be interested in. And of course, you can landing pages can be offers as well. Like for those of you who are joining the series right now, more or less, you end up landing on this page where you sign up and we gave you an idea of what this is all about and convert you. If you scroll down this page, you would have seen the videos that we did in the past. And, and it helped you decide whether you're going to sign up for this one so that you can have access to whatever latest content that we're going to come out uh, in the process. Uh, another typical landing page is maybe you want to convert people to customers. So like in our case, we have interim um, uh, content, uh, paid content. So we're, we're, we're doing it through Patreon. So we have $5 patrons, $10 patrons, $15, $20, $25, $30. We also have two hundred dollar patrons, among others, and and these are how they call how they call it a bite size uh, conversion uh, tactics, no? And then we also have premium content, like for those joining our certification program, signing up for the whole thing, and investing more in the process. I always um, tell students that what I've learned. Uh, through the years of uh, marketing something online, it's good that you come up with packages that people can easily afford, but sooner or later, you need to have a premium content, a premium content where there's a bigger investment, but in the process, you're really getting the, the serious players in. And, in, and having a premium content uh, can also serve as a premium showcase of what you can offer because you are more or less dictating that this is the highest value of what I can give. Um, it's 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 part of your it's part of your branding um, component, no? So 
So I hope that when you think about your brand, especially if you have a 10-year strategy or a 20-year strategy, uh, part of that strategy must be coming up with a premium content that will more or less um, uh, solidify your brand in the long run. No? Uh, recently, I also signed up with the uh, John Maxwell team and uh, in leveled up as an independent uh, executive director. So for me, the John Maxwell team is also an example of a premium content uh, series. Um, it's an area that I think I'm going to branch into and expand and see that it is relevant because I think I've reached the, the right stage in time to be able to start expanding into this type of content and, uh, not, just, not, and not just limit myself to technical content. So, part of your social media campaign and digital marketing campaign is what people see on your website and the content that you're going to disseminate online. And a lot of the content that we also disseminate includes photos, product photos, service photos, profile photos, um, action photos, uh, among other things. So, in one of our sessions on product photos, product photography we always talk about uh, we talked about image guidelines and don't forget that uh, not following image guidelines on your website will make your site heavy but at the same time you can create a negative impression about your brand same thing on whatever you post on social media um, that that includes uh, photos be very careful about the photos that you share because they they will influence what people may perceive about your brand so make sure that if you want to communicate a professional image then make sure that your photos will help uh, convey the same all right and uh, before uploading uh, any image uh, make sure that you've taken them yourself or you have paid someone to do it for you if you're gonna use uh, third party or stock photos make sure that you've paid for them uh, like in my case, I have stock photos that I bought through Shutterstock when I was still a subscriber. So I had to make sure that uh, I, or some, some of them I got also from platforms like Pixabay. So, so, but another thing when choosing photos or images that you're going to use for your campaign, campaigns, please avoid cliches. No? What do I mean by avoid? cliches you know the overused photos like for example when someone talks about privacy or security they always use a padlock when someone talks about coding they always use that matrix uh how do you call it screen where codes were just dropping around or scrolling around somewhere no uh when people talk about uh targets they always show the bullseye image no so avoid cliches so take a lot of photos think about your stories uh think about what 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 imagery can be associated with them and start gathering photos or start taking photos and just keep taking photos you know because sooner or later you might be able to find the right story the the that where that photo can fit, where that where you can use that photo to communicate yourself better or to communicate your ideas, no? So just a food for thought on that. And make your, of course, helping and make your photo team consistent for your website. One thing that I like about the John Maxwell team, because they gave us a pre-made uh, website already, I like how they are very consistent with their photos, with their images, their fonts. Um, and I think the reason for that also is because they want to convey some form of a, of a professional image. And I'm learning a lot as to how they're doing things as well. So also, make sure that when you are doing your digital marketing campaign, you're doing things in a legitimate way, you know, because there are rules to follow when selling online. I remember uh, I gave a criticism or some sort of a feedback not. I don't know if you want to call it criticism or feedback. It depends on your perspective, I guess. When I saw this campaign about promoting a course and then the promotion of the course said that if you buy two tickets, 
uh, of 100 pesos each, you will be included in a raffle where if you win in the raffle, you will get access to this 8,000 peso course. And there are like five people who's going to win in the raffle. And that was a sponsored post on Facebook. And it was supposed to teach about you know, how to get rich, strategy, digital marketing, freelancing, and the likes. And, 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 and I saw it. I said, how can you claim that, you know, that you know all of these things when, when the primary rule when running promos online, especially if you're promising people to win or participate in a raffle, is that you need to have a DTI promotions permit. You know? Otherwise, how can you guarantee that you're, the way you're going to draw the price is going to be legitimate. How do you know how many people have bought that ticket? Uh, how do you know whether there's going to be a real winner anyway or the name that's going to be announced are bogus to begin with? So there are rules that needs to be followed. So, so that is why um, when we do our social media marketing campaigns, uh, please make sure that if you're going to be creative with your campaigns, that you are following a uh, fair and reasonable business practice. Uh, the products or services that you're marketing are allowed to be marketed in the Philippines. They meet uh, safety and quality guidelines. Um, ideally, there's a requirement for transparency for people marketing their services. Like They need to demonstrate that they are a legitimate business. Contact information must be available. Although be very worried because uh, like recently there are a lot of investment scams and some of the people promoting investments are showing their DTI registration number. But in reality, if you want to offer any investment deals, you cannot be DTI registered. You need to be SEC registered. And your investment offering must have approval from the SEC. So we don't so meaning even if people are flashing their registration does not mean that they are authorized to offer what they are offering so we have to be uh, familiar as well and if you are familiar of these requirements then it's also part of your role to be vigilant and uh, call the attention of people who who are who are misleading other people by doing practices that can uh, discredit the industry or discredit the sector okay and um, so in essence, we are required to be transparent, give accurate information. You, you need to enable consumers to make an informed decision. Uh, because if you're doing a lot of social media marketing campaign, promoting products or services, the moment you are not transparent um, with your terms, with what the product is all about, if your consumers will encounter problems with the products or services that you are offering, it can also backfire on you, especially if complaints starts coming in and disputes starts coming in challenging these products or services that are being offered. And of course, it's a uh, don't forget, no, it's a uh, consumer rights month. Uh, last week I was in Naga because there was this big seminar there about consumer rights. You know, last night I had a weird experience and I had to, and at midnight, I had to pause and think whether whether I made a mistake or not. I don't know, huh? um, how many of you have used uh, Uber since it started? I remember when Uber started, I remember that the cancellation fee for any trip was 50 pesos. That was as far as I can remember was the cancellation fee because I remember having trips where there was some cancellation, whether from my end or from the end of the driver, where I got charged 50 pesos. And I remember disputing that charge. Um, I don't know. How many of you can still remember when the cancellation fee of Uber was uh, 50 pesos? Can any of you recall that? Um, but of course, being charged with cancellation fees are very rare. So I know it was a very rare occurrence on my end. But last night, uh, uh, as I came from Sambuanga, I booked a trip and and realized that the driver had to complete another trip and and he's coming from a bit far away place and he need to drop off a passenger at Terminal 3 where I was and I and 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 because of that I'm more or less sure that he will be dropping off a passenger at the departure area that means that he will need to do another round before he can pick me up at the at 
arrival area of Terminal 3. So I was computing that oh, even though it was saying six minutes, that would be actually times three because he's going to spin. Uh, he's going to do another round again. And uh, But that is not normally seen uh, in the tracking of Uber because uh, as far as they're concerned, they're arriving at the airport. It's not about whether they are in departure or in arrival. And uh, so I, I tried booking a grab ride, hoping that I would get a faster uh, ride. So, so maybe I did, and I went beyond the five minutes already. So by the time I was canceling my Uber ride, I was surprised that there was a 100 pesos cancellation fee. So anyway, I paid for it, and then I started thinking that was supposed to be 50 pesos because I remember I used to be charged 50 pesos, and I even, and I recall a dispute uh, on a transaction charge that happened before. And so I posted, I messaged Uber last night, hey, Uber, when did you increase your cancellation fee from 50 to 100 pesos? I don't remember receiving any notification to consumers about it. And when did LPFRB approve the increase? And then I think somebody replied that it has always been 100. And I was dumbfounded. So I was really thinking, no, it used to be 50 pesos. <laughs> no? So anyway, it went through a back and forth discussion. So I guess that's just water under the bridge. But I still really believe that it was 50 pesos. No? Uh, and it was, it was only changed to 100 pesos uh, recently. And if I am correct, uh, then then I was looking for anything about my consumer rights, like being informed, like when when did that approval happen? Um, was because at the end of the day, consumer rights is all about you, especially if it's a utility company. Uh, you need to be consulted. Uh, any any change of rates must be proposed, uh, um, discussed before it gets approved or disapproved. No. Of course, if you are a service provider and not necessarily a utility or a public service, like in this case, transportation, you're not subjected to that. However, um, even though you're not, your consumers may not necessarily welcome any price rate changes that easily. So you need to think about any rates that you may want to impose and how you're going to change the rates, whether it's going to be to the benefit to your customers or not, or whether this will further reduce people who can afford your products or services. But of course, as I, as I said always, you can come up with premium services, especially if you believe that it's going gonna, it's gonna to allow you to reach out the 20% who's going to give 80% of your income. Um, and remember that whatever products or services that you come out with, even though they're fantastic in your perspective, um, not everyone will care about it. A strategizer said the creators of the business model canvas and the value proposition canvas, seven out of ten don't care about new products that gets introduced to the market. So that's why we're campaigning. We want people to care about what we have to offer to the market. So that is why our social media campaign cannot just focus on one aspect because there is a path to purchase that you need to respect that consumers go through. There's awareness, there's consideration and decision. Uh, awareness is letting people know that you exist, um, and, but not necessarily making them buy right away, but making them aware that you're there and what value you have to offer. And hopefully you will be able to present more content so that they can consider you and hopefully, if you're able to build trust and justify, and and really com really show the value why this why your prospects would need it and why they need it right away, will allow will convert them to you as a customer. So, so throughout these stages, whether in the awareness, consideration, or decision, we have to communicate as part of our campaigns. Uh, or as part of our social media campaign, content that will resonate with the user. Um, think about the problems that they're going through, making sure that we have content, published content on social media that will target people with that problem. And, and you can follow it through with a conversion offer where you can recommend a solution in the form of a product or service that they can avail of. 
But first, before you can recommend a solution, you must show that you you can relate to what they're going through, that you can resonate with them by understanding their problems, uh, helping them uh, process it further, and, and suggest solutions that they can uh, explore and hopefully get them to come your way. So searcher's intent is uh, very important. Of course, we use this as a guide in improving the content on our website, but the same can also be achieved uh, when creating content for social media because a lot of people are using social media also as a search engine platform like uh, Facebook. A lot of people are using Facebook to search for stuff. So even though we're posting content there casually, but we also have to be sensitive that what keywords are they using? What exactly are they looking for? And uh, you want to uh, make sure and hope or, you know, that, when, that the post that you're creating will also appear on somebody's search result and hopefully be, a, be of value to that person. Um, as 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 that content can fit their requirements, no. And um, bottom line, it's all about content. Uh, social media campaign, digital marketing campaign, it's all about content. The content that we post on social media, the content in our emails, on our blog, on our landing page, the offer itself, no, how we write it, it's all about content. So we need to keep on improving the way we write our content, we present our content, and communicate the relevance of our content. It must be able to add a distinct value that uh, those who get to read it will want to know you more, will try to ask you more questions, get your opinion and participation. The content that you will use for your social media campaign should allow a person to decide that they want to choose you over other players in the market. The content that you're churning out uh, through your social media campaign uh, must be able to show that you're willing to invest in a relationship with your target market and hopefully in the process may also make them decide that they want to have a relationship with you. And if that is achieved, then it is your job to make sure that it's going to be a healthy and thriving relationship, that you can grow with them and that they can grow with you or in the process, you grow together in the process. So the story um, that we use for our social media uh, should reflect who you are and the values that matter to you because at the end of the day, it's all about building trust, especially if you want to foster uh, or if you want, as part of your campaign goals, you also want to establish relevance, credibility, or you want to um, develop some form of loyalty in the long run, then it requires some certain transparency. Like when you come up with ideas, you talk about the inspiration behind it, how are you testing your ideas to your target market. Um, you can also talk about how your product has evolved. And of course, social proof can help, like testimonials, among other things, and how people have uh, benefited. And that is why from time to time, we post status updates showing us in action because those are all part of your social proof. But you have to do that cautiously because the last thing that you want is you might end up creating an impression that you're bragging. You know? So the content creation process, um, especially if you're going to do it for a social media campaign or for a digital marketing campaign, um, starts by identifying your buyer persona, the value proposition of your products and services, your respect to the buyer's process, and creating content um, that will support putting together one, two, and three and creating templates uh, that you can use uh, throughout your uh, social media marketing campaign process. And, um, and, and of course, all of this content that we're marketing through social media, uh, they need to be interconnected so that if people would like to learn more, they ha you have other links that they can visit. 
So, for example, when we're marketing this e-commerce and digital marketing mentoring program for MSMEs and freelancers, we gave links to YouTube videos. Then we gave links to our free courses. And in our free courses, there are links to uh, premium content. Uh, so all of them are interrelated. They are all part of the link network that you have established uh, that shows how um, that, that, that should communicate or imply uh, that you are credible in the process. Okay, so building credible links is not just about getting inbound links and rank in search engine results, but how you plan your content, how they connect to one another, that the moment a person goes through their buyer's journey from awareness, consideration, decision, these interconnected links um, help this person decide, will help this person decide whether they want to deal with you or not. Baka sabihin niya, ang galing mo online, dami-dami mo sinasabi eh. Pero, you know, outside of online, parang wala akong makitang iba. Parang, yan na yon yan na yung meron ka lang. Parang bang, lahat ng sinabi mo, yan na lang ba yun? May, may ganong target market na mag-isip eh. Um, I think as your target market becomes more educated, the more they demand, the more they expect. They want more. They expect more. So, um, kaya, kaya kailangan talaga ipakita mo na nandun yung commitment mo. How, and, and interlinking your content, weaving a story that more or less uh, gives a purview of who you are, what you're offering, how you evolve, how, you, you know, you, where your inspiration is, you know. It, it puts all the pieces together or as popularly referred to, it connects the dots. No? So you need to interconnect your internal and external content. And dami ko na sinabi, meron pala akong slide doon. Okay, so rank in, uh, technically, you, you want to rank in search for your chosen keywords, whether in search or in social media. Um, and of course, that is best achieved by having strategic content. And even though you don't, act, you don't need to ask influencers because if people like your content, they're gonna share it anyway. The there are what 64 million internet users in the Philippines, so it's impossible that your top 10 friends on Facebook that you believe has the 10 most popular blogs are the only influencers in town. Uh, at the minimum, I could say that there's at least 1% influencers out there. We just don't know who they all are. They are influencers in their own right. Or if you're more optimistic, then you can say 10% of them are influencers. Or if you believe that everyone is an influencer, then there's there there are more numbers to that, right? So, so keep building that content and connect them. So... When you do your social media campaign, yeah, our campaigns may run for seven days, 21 days. But if you use pillar content for your social media campaign, then your the life of your social media campaign does not end at the end of the campaign. They can become pillar content on your website or on your social media channel that even though they're old content, even though they may be classified as old content, they can still appear in Facebook search results, or in um, uh, or in Google search results, because they're still relevant to people. So each campaign must must allow you to establish pillar content that keeps on uh, building up, or that may still be relevant even a year from now. Like the webinar series that we did last year, they're still ranking now, no? Uh, that even though we have less than a thousand subscribers on YouTube, but we had more than a hundred thousand views on YouTube. So, so there are many things that you can uh, consider, diba? So, of course, a lot of, of a lot of the content that we're doing uh, needs to be carried out through social media. So, make sure that whatever platform. Uh, you're gonna use it's uh, your target persona is there um, 
you know the value of that social media channel and what it can give you. Uh, choose channels that you really have time to build, maintain, and monitor it. Like for me, my primary channels are uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, but now I included YouTube. Uh, I used to spend a lot of time on Twitter, but not, not that much anymore, but I still consider it to be important. You decide how many posts a week, how much do you want to scale the, the channel, and establish your goals in the channel and why is it important for you. So, for example, we achieved our 20,000 mark on Facebook back in, I think that was in 2014 or 2015. Maybe 2015. Yeah, I think 2015. Uh, we haven't really grown that much since, but we haven't really dropped that much either. I mean, there's a constant uh, unlike, like, like, unlike, like, unlike, like, unlike in the, in the social media channel. So sometimes it's not about just scaling. Sometimes it's all about maintaining it. And uh, hopefully uh, you're still relevant to the audience who decide, who decide to join, replenishing the ones who have unfollowed your channel because they have outgrown you already. No? So your buyer's journey. In the buyer's journey, your presence must answer the question why. No? Um, why do they want to be with you? Why do they want to trust you? Why is this your chosen subject of expertise? Why do you care about the subject? Why are you doing this? Why will this matter to me? Um, you know, your, your prospects will have a lot of why questions. So the more you can anticipate these questions, the more you can answer them in your head, um, much sooner that it will also help you shape up the kind of content that you might want to create on your site and as part of your social media campaign. Um, of course, in the last session, in one of our sessions on social media calendar and scheduling, I showed the importance of creating calendars. So this is a light example. We're using a calendar blank template from coschedule.com for this purpose. Uh, I'm supposed to fill up the date and the name of the project, but this is just an example of how a typical campaign might look like. Now, normally, a campaign would usually reflect posts that you will make on social media channels. But if your intention also is uh, to do a sales conversion, then I think your activity should not be limited to what you post on social media, especially if you are also after conversion. So I might talk about posting a free lesson on Monday and posting a $5 webinar also on that day, but I should make time, but I should also ensure that I will make time to send an email follow-up, a PM follow-up, uh, maybe call one or two persons on that, day, on, on that day and set up a meeting. So, so being a marketer, doing social media marketing campaigns is not all about just posting on social media. It's also about what's what's equally important or even more important is the follow through. You know? um, the follow through on people who are engaging with your content, who sent you inquiries, uh, getting back to them because... At the end of the day, sales conversion will not just happen where they keep on pestering you or following up with you. Oh, bibili na ako, paano ba, paano ba? Rare yung ganun, no? Sales conversion happened because you followed up and you show that you're really sincere in doing business with the other person. Uh, kaya this year, dun sa mga task ko sa mga students, sa aming mga training programs this year, it's not just about three posts a day anymore. It's all about three activities a day. So it can be, I will post one free lesson and I will do an email follow-up and a call. Tomorrow, I will not po do any posts, but I will do follow-ups tomorrow. So it's all about doing three things every day, whatever those things are, and being consistent about it. All right? So I would suggest that when you think about your social media campaign, um, think about it also on that process, uh, especially if you're the kind of person who's responsible also for the conversion, especially if you're the MSME, or if you are a freelancer and you're doing a campaign for yourself, hoping to get clients for your freelancer business. 
uh, of course, if you can design your content beforehand, like ano yung magiging laman ng post-free lesson offer mo, ano yung magiging laman ng $5 offer mo, ano yung laman ng status update, ano yung laman ng free invite, ano yung laman ng $10 offer or your question post. If you can plan them ahead, and uh, think about it, the better, because it gives you time also to do, to calibrate it, rather than kung ano lang yung maisip mo on that day, yun lang ipost mo. For freelancers, normally your clients would ask that ahead of time and have it approved. For MSMEs, normally on the day itself, you just come up with the post and that's it. But ideally, you want to be able to prepare a week's content ahead of time so that you will have more or less uh, some work Workroom, no, para to improve it, to think about your captions better, and how you can fine tune them better, no. And of course, um, a social media campaign will not be effective without the appropriate back end support. And the appropriate back end support is having a system to record your leads and uh, follow up on them and keeping track of your customers. That is why we had a session on customer relationship management uh, in our series. So we talked about through digital marketing campaigns, we can build relationship with leads and hopefully we sustain that relationship so we can convert them to customers and work on maintaining that relevance in that relationship so that this person will, will remain uh, loyal and hopefully Will, con will always consider you to be likable and as a preferred uh, partner. So, so here's an example, a customer relationship management process that can be supportive of a digital marketing campaign or a social media marketing campaign can have these aspects. On the marketing part, maybe you're carrying out your 21-day or 66-day campaign with the intention of building a leads database and connecting with your leads. But of course, these are just one thing. You need to sustain them with, with what I mentioned earlier, with the call, follow up, or set up a meeting. Uh, so that, and that's part of the sales process where you can qualify your leads, send proposal, track their response, and do the necessary follow up so that you can push them for conversion. And uh, part of the process also in the 21 day campaign as part of the admin support. It's all about delivering that products or service, the billing, the payment, delivering the product, and getting the necessary feedback from your target market. And uh, part of your marketing, apart from just getting leads, uh, you're also creating awareness. You're also creating um, relevance and credibility campaign. And that can be supported by your educational content, training, and resolving concerns uh, from your target market. So. Your 21-day campaign is more, your digital marketing or social media marketing campaign is actually more than just what you post on social media. The successful ones, I mean the really serious ones, look at it from um, from a full perspective no? and, and put up the necessary resources to ensure that they are addressed and that they can be converted and, and maximize the resources that you invested in the campaign process. Follow-ups are important. No? That is why I included that in the calendar. When the person inquires from you for the first time as a result of your campaign, maybe you will just answer the chat message and send them a link uh, and then forget about it unless they inquire. But it's good that you make, if you record them in your CRM that this person inquired, then you need to remind yourself if it's on Facebook Messenger, add a label that you need to follow up with this person ask whether they got the chance to visit the site, do they have any questions that you can help them with, and maybe after responding, you might want to send them another useful material that, that can help them decide. And then, um, and, 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 and if that conversation is positive, or at least it's not a negative or a door closure conversation, you can, you can still tag that person for follow up and do a follow up number three. You know? Is there anything that they may need or do they have further questions? And maybe that's the time that you find out that they have referred it to their boss for decision. Then um, 
does your boss have any question that where I can provide additional information? Ah, he's looking for case studies, uh, success stories, then maybe you can send another material for that. Um, maybe after fo follow-up number three, the, that's a sign if the person hasn't gotten back to you, maybe they're not yet getting the ghost signal that they are expecting. So you maintain the relationship by by keep on sending useful material, inviting them to your webinars, uh, sharing an interesting white paper that you might have uh, come up with lately, or maybe have a webinar series that you want to invite them. But at the end of the day, it's all about strengthening that connection. And uh, maybe inviting them in one of your events, give them a free slot so that you can use that as an opportunity to have a dialogue. And, uh, and if you have time to set a meeting so that and give a feedback that you're doing a survey or you're coming up with a new product or service and you want to get their input or feedback to see whether it's going to fit industry needs. And if that person trusts you because of all the useful content that you have sent them beforehand, more or less that person will accommodate you for a meeting or even a Skype conversation and hopefully uh, give you all the inputs that uh, you need. And if that conversation is positive to the point that person has expressed interest, then maybe you can present alternative conversion uh, or alternative offer that can still convert that person to a customer. So you cannot just give up on any prospect from their very first inquiry and then and maybe they did not reply to you right away. You need to be more patient. You need to be more tactical uh, with your approach. That is why campaigns are not short term. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. And if you don't have a campaign, um, then you're just, you know, you're not really measuring up whether, you're not really measuring whether you're doing well or not, no? So uh, each campaign tries to uh, further strengthen strengthen your credibility but each campaign can also help you convert more people to become your customers uh, especially if you are really looking at it from a cycle uh, perspective as i showed you earlier in my slides so you need to have some stage workflow as i showed earlier like what are you going to do from the first time that they inquired uh, from day two to seven, how are you going to reach out to them from follow up and whether you want a transaction or not. So you need to have a process so that your social media campaign will be able to churn results. Because if all you will report as an achievement of your campaign is how many likes, how many reach, how many commented, how many shares, I think that's so, anion, that's so, I know. That's so 2010 or 2011 social media goals. No? Uh, nowadays, it's all about conversion. It's all about results. It's all about ROI. No? So, and for, for people who, who will say that there's no ROI in social media, maybe you, you haven't really thought about it hard enough as to how your social media or digital marketing campaign fit in your overall picture you know? and it depends also what follow-up strategies methodologies you have established in the process and follow-up um, is all about behavioral no? so it depends no? if they inquired they visited your website they filled up a form these are all behavioral actions where you, where it can trigger you to send a follow-up conversation and hopefully uh, convert them to what you want them to be so remember, in our email marketing lesson, make sure that when you, when you decide to send an email, make sure that the subject line is attention grabbing, that you are the sender and not somebody else. Uh, solidify your branding in the process by reminding them what your brand is all about. It's not just about the logo. Uh, make sure that you are able to communicate what value you are offering and answer the question that they may have. And then give them links that can help them uh, decide if they want to proceed or not and even perhaps give them information on how they can proceed it's okay to send cold emails but what is usually suggested is that you don't sell through emails you only send educational content uh, through emails to make sure that you always go to the inbox rather than the promotions tab um, 
last but not the least, of course, when you do your social media marketing campaigns or digital marketing campaigns for that matter, and often a uh, question asked is, do you need to advertise? It depends on your budget and it depends on who is your target market. If you're targeting to an existing customer base, maybe you don't need to. But if you are aggressive with your targets and you, you have resources to do it, then yeah, maybe you need to advertise. And uh, of course, your advertising strategy must complement whatever is your uh, goals for this entire campaign, whether to get people to buy or visit your website or, or maybe fill out a lead form or maybe you want them to call you or just see your brand out there or maybe you want them to visit your establishment. For search, of course, you can use Google AdWords uh, for that purpose. They have five advertising options like search, display, video, shopping, and mobile. I encourage you to check out our search advertising uh, lesson as posted on our YouTube channel to learn more about this. Uh, what I like about uh, Google Ads is that they are very creative in a sense that you can add extensions so that people can call you from the ad platform itself. Uh, you can give them directions uh, among others. And of course, people who find you through search are more serious um, because they are more intentional in what they're looking for in comparison to people who may have found you on social media through ads unless they found you because they were searching for information also on Facebook. And um, there are many creative ways that you can engage uh, audiences on uh, Google AdWords, but what I would encourage you to try are the Gmail ads because uh, Gmail ads are very affordable and they also convert. And if you like creating videos, I would also encourage you to engage your audience through YouTube ads because if people uh, skip the ad, I think in less than 30 seconds, you're not paying for anything. So at least you'll be able to maximize your advertising pesos or advertising dollars by utilizing the options that are affordable. Shopping ads, if you have an e-commerce sites, are also powerful because they appear as shopping options already on the search results. And at the same time, they're also one of the cheapest uh, ways to ad advertise on on. on um, Facebook, of course, can also be, Facebook and Instagram are also popular platforms for advertising. In our previous lesson, we talked about uh, social media advertising and, pre and previously before that as well, we talked about uh, search advertising. But for this one, I'm just going to um, quickly uh, talk about the popular options. Of course, you can use it to raise brand awareness, generate leads. You can drive traffic to your store or drive traffic to your website or promote your apps. And uh, normally, if, if your intention is to build awareness, uh, video ads are now popular for that purpose because they can help uh, drive attention of people. And if you want to influence consideration, you can also use carousel ads. What makes carousel ads interesting is that you can link each photo to a different part of your website. So let's say you're running a carousel ad featuring uh, seven photo photos in a series. So each photo can be linked to a different part of your website so that it will direct people to the appropriate uh, product page where you want them to be brought to. And uh, they also have uh, tools to drive leads and sales that like they have uh, lead ads that people will click on it. Um, it will pop up a form that uh, that anyone can fill out. And of course, uh, they now have messenger ads as well so that if people are interested, then they can um, respond uh, like a chatbot, like what options do they want to take. And if they want to, for, to pursue further the conversation with you, they can proceed and type whatever questions they may have based on your offer. So as you can see, uh, when we think about digital marketing or social media marketing, there are many things that you need to consider from search visibility because people will search for you if they've seen you on social media, especially if they want to validate how relevant and how credible you are. They will, judge, they will look at you on social media and see whether you are responsive in, on their inquiries. They will check out your content and your content 
can can make you or break you and can also serve as a stick whether this whether your target market will see you as relevant or not serious is okay but definitely boring is not so it's all about, it's always about adding value to your target segment and of course relationship management how you follow up and sustain that relationship with your target segment so that's how big the digital marketing space is although in the philippines um, referring to it as social media marketing is uh, seems to be more popular and seems to stick more to people so for digital filipino we want to we are always pushing for this flywheel that at the end of the day in online of course it all starts with your domain uh, what your brand is all about. So Digital Filipino started in 1999. So you can say that our domain will reach uh, 20 years old soon. So you know, we've built a lot of content to strengthen the authority of our domain. Uh, we've grown through the years through social, email, and word of mouth channels. And uh, through the content that we've created, we were able to earn direct search referral and social media traffic. We've ranked. Uh, in a lot of keywords as of today. Uh, we can say that we have a reasonable number of targeted email and subscribers to our platform. And uh, we've, we've had our fair share of links, um, links and shares in the process. And I guess more importantly, um, it allows us to serve more people than we could imagine if rather than doing that by myself to our website, we're able to reach out to many more people that we cannot reach out face to face. And uh, it allowed us also to achieve our Pareto. I mean, reaching out to the 20% who gives us our 80%. So I hope that as you run your social media campaign, um, I wish you success. And I hope that the insights that we shared here today will help you in your uh, digital marketing campaigns in the future, whether you are promoting yourself as an MSME or you are promoting yourself as a freelancer. All right, it's now 11.29. Thank you very much for joining our learning session for today.